Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so we're very lucky to have Kat join us. Uh, she was actually part of our first initial uh, Suncoast Developers Conference and she brought up this topic and a lot of folks haven't really heard about DOCSIS code. So she was gracious enough to come back and do a crash course for us. Um, just to do a little intro, um, I am Catherine Trammell. I'm the campus director at Suncoast Developers Guild. Uh, for anyone that's not familiar with us, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit. Uh, so we do free community events like this um, and we are also a code school. So we do a full month program or full Three month program, uh, which is a full stack doing uh, front end HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We dive into React. And then on the back end, we use .NET C Sharp. Uh, so we are also offering part time classes. Right now, we have a kind of intro to web development that's going on uh, currently. And then hopefully in 2021, we're going to offer some different options for y'all. So keep an eye on our website and our Slack channel. And if anyone's not in our uh, community Slack, I'll post the link into the uh, chat. So you can also join up there to reach out to more community folks. Um, but otherwise, thank you, Kat, for joining us and doing this crash course for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you take over. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Um, hi uh, uh, to the folks who are here and might also be sort of watching at a later time. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, my name is Kat Betwigas, um, and as Catherine mentioned, um, I uh, had done a little bit of uh, talking about DOCSIS code at the uh, uh, most recent um, Suncoast uh, Developers Conference. Um, my talk at the conference was really just more of sort of sharing uh, my DOCSIS code experience so far. Um, it wasn't really a, you know, sort of super specialized or super technical um, uh, talk. So uh, I figured that for today's crash course, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Docs Code again, uh, in case there are any folks who weren't able to catch um, the conference talk uh, from, from this summer. Um, but then hopefully the bulk, uh, the bulk of this uh, crash course is going to uh, actually be hands-on. Um, we'll be uh, kind of getting uh, our hands dirty with um, a DOCSIS code kind of workflow. Um, it's going to be uh, a relatively simple workflow um, and it would, um, it's going to require uh, you know, just a little bit of familiarity um, with some sort of programming tools already, such as, um, you know, the command line, uh, using a text editor and stuff like that. Um, but I promise that I am going to go very slow. Um, and this is also, uh, I'm not really intending on making this like a super formal uh, course. I'm a very informal person as well. So, um, um, if you have any questions at any, at any point, feel free to just chime in. Um, I may also throw back uh, some questions uh, to the participants, uh, just to you know, kind of start a discussion and whatnot. Um, I may also make some mistakes along the way, um, but that'll be fine. Uh, and hopefully uh, it'll be you know, a uh, sort of learning opportunity for everyone. And so we'll just kind of um, sort of go through this together and, and hopefully have have fun along the way. All right, so uh, so my I have two monitors and <laughs> my slides are on the other monitor, uh, so I have to look this way, although I know that you guys are this way. Um, but um, just to, I guess, get us started, um, uh, that's me again, Kat Betwigas. Uh, I can be found on the socials uh, through uh, these handles. Um, and I am also happy to, I guess, share my email address if that's possible in case people have, you know, further questions uh, sort of after this workshop, um, if, if you like. All right, so what we'll do for um, this evening. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about Docs Code. I won't be spending too, too much time on it, um, but I figured I would sort of do a rehash um, in case people um, uh, would like to kind of refresh their memory um, or still aren't familiar with, with what DOCSIS code is. 
So what is Docsis code? Um, what does a Docsis code system look like? Um, what kind of what what sorts of tools might you be using? Um, uh, what does a sort of workflow, a Docsis code workflow look like? Um, are there any pros and cons to using Docsis code? Um, so I I uh, Catherine uh, uh, let me know that um, a question had come in. Um, from uh, the registrants or uh, one of the registrants about um, this. Uh, if I was going to kind of talk about um, uh, or touch on the topic of what makes good documentation at all. Um, so that is not going to be uh, the focus of this crash course, but uh, it's a really good question. And, you know, obviously you can't really um, sort of separate um, a sort of documentation writing system from the idea of like, well, what makes good documentation in the first place? Um, so I'm, I'm definitely going to touch on that a little bit. Um, and depending on, you know, how this goes, how much time we have left, um, we could, we could even sort of turn it into a discussion because I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person uh, on this Zoom uh, meeting uh, that has, you know, any ideas or thoughts about uh, what what is considered uh, good documentation. And after that, we'll go into the hands-on portion. So uh, I will be uh, walking uh, through sort of the uh, DOCSIS code steps um, um, on the screen. Uh, I do have the instructions um, written down uh, in a GitHub repository uh, that I that we can look at that I can share. Um, so in case you know people get lost or just want to refer to the thing like on their own screens, um, uh, that will be made available uh, later as well. And what that is basically going to look like is we'll we'll. We'll pretend that we have uh, this existing project that we already sort of started developing. Um, so it's going to be like a boilerplate uh, uh, kind of uh, app. It's, it's not even really an app, but let's just pretend that it is. Um, it's just a little bit of source code that um, we're going to sort of treat as our project source that we are writing documentation for. Um, we will use Hugo as well as GitHub Pages to uh, build and deploy uh, this documentation site. Um, so basically what we're doing here is uh, we have our, our project, right? And um, we uh, want to share it to the world and we want folks to be able to sort of understand it, use it, and maybe even contribute to it um, if, if you want it to be like an open source kind of project um, or a collaborative uh, kind of project. Um, uh, we, you know, uh, if, if, if you're sort of putting together a, a project repository, um, chances are you might have already thought about, or hopefully you've thought about uh, adding a readme uh, to, to the project, and that's totally fine, and that's uh, we'll look into, well, actually, if, if if we want to have like a dedicated uh, site for our project, um, sorry, a dedicated documentation site for our project, what does that look like? Um, and I do also uh, kind of want <clears throat> to emphasize that the documentation site is going to be separate from, from the project site itself. Let's say uh, if, if it's a web app that you're deploying, um, the documentation is not going to live uh, in the same place, and I'm I'm not a sort of build and deploy expert, so <laughs> there might be you know various reasons <clears throat> or various uh, sort of uh, other tools or platforms that you'll be using uh, to to share your project with the world. Um, but for for tonight, um, we're what I'm going to focus on uh, sharing with you all is well, aside from or or let's assume that we've already figured out how to deploy the project itself. What about the documentation? Where how can we share that? Where can we put that? Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. Oops. 
uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's our agenda for tonight. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I work at a small uh, tech company called Crunchy Data. Um, we uh, do enterprise uh, PostgreSQL. Um, if you're, uh, you may already be familiar with Postgres, it's a rel relational database management system. Um, and it's uh, part of the free and open source uh, software world. Um, so basically what we do is we help enterprises uh, figure out Postgres. And uh, what I do at Crunchy Data is I'm a uh, content specialist on the developer relations team. Um, I've uh, helped write documentation uh, for, for Postgres uh, related projects. Um, and I do also produce other uh, Postgres and developer related content as well. Um, so basically my job is to, I'm, I'm paid to learn things and write about them uh, and hopefully help, help developers and Postgres users um, uh, succeed and live, live their best life. All right, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll get this uh, sort of DOCSIS code uh, discussion started with um, this definition. Um, so as you can see on the slide, uh, DOCSIS code uh, is an approach. Uh, it's a philosophy uh, to creating documentation. Um, and I lifted this definition from the Write the Docs website. Um, Write the Docs is a uh, community of uh, uh, not just technical writers, but um, basically people who care about um, just documentation in general. So it's a very sort of um, diverse uh, group of folks uh, in, in tech and in, in, in software. Um, they have uh, meetups uh, and conferences uh, uh, surrounding, you know, the idea of, of, of documentation, just topics related to documentation. They have a lot of resources uh, related to uh, writing documentation as well as DOCSIS code. Um, so, so they do have um, this definition up there on their website. Um, and the, the point here is that um, your, your writing uh, documentation using the same tools as you would use um, to write your you know, project or app code. Um, and of course, DOCSIS code is not the only way of managing uh, or writing or publishing documentation. Um, before I worked for uh, Crunchy Data, uh, I worked at another tech company and I also wrote documentation, uh, user documentation there. And we definitely didn't use DOCSIS code. Um, I, uh, you know, our, our documentation writers were not developers, uh, were, you know, didn't really have any sort of specialized uh, programming uh, skills or experience. Uh, and most of our audience <clears throat> um, was also uh, not uh, developers. So uh, the system that we used was um, probably something that might be sort of more generally familiar to to people even outside of tech as well. Um, so you might be using, you know, a content management system to sort of uh, store your doc content. Um, you might be using um, Microsoft Word or Google Docs to kind of write out your content. Um, and you might be sort of sharing uh, that content, um, say internally or, or, or whatever your needs are. Um, through, you know, platforms like Google Drive, SharePoint, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, that also worked fine. Um, not DOCSIS code, but for, um, you know, for, for our audience, um, for, for our needs, uh, for, for their needs, sorry, the, the, the um, user's needs, um, DOCSIS code was uh, not going to be suitable. Um, and I'm going to kind of touch on that a little bit um, later um, in this sort of discussion about what, what DOCSIS code looks like. All right, so um, for DOCSIS code, there is no sort of one rigid or specific setup that you have to use really. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to depend on 
um, your requirements, um, your team, your project. Um, but on a general level, um, these are uh, on the left hand side of the screen or the slide. Um, these are some of the things that you're going to kind of uh, see in common. Um, you uh, typically will be writing your documentation content um, using plain text uh, and um, storing those in plain text files. Uh, so not Word documents, but you know, um, uh, .md files or, or .txt files, let's say. And since you're also, um, you're using the same tools that you would um, for writing documentation as um, writing your project source code, um, you'll use a text editor to sort of compose uh, your doc content as well. Um, uh, most docs as code systems uh, have some sort of document automation uh, kind of element to it where um, from the, you know, from your plain text files, uh, how can you turn that into, you know, the actual HTML and other assets um, that <clears throat> would need to go up to a web server so other people can access, you know, your doc site on the web. Um, version control is also a key uh, uh, element of uh, docs as code. And, um, uh, some docs code systems might use uh, issue tracking, uh, some, some form of, you know, project kind of management tool um, to, uh, to, to figure out, you know, who, who needs to do the updating or, or, or what, what needs to be updated in the documentation. Um, and you might be doing some form of validation um, on your uh, documentation code um for you know various reasons um you might um be running you might run linters uh to make sure that your sort of doc documentation code um is correct um you might also be running uh continuous integration scripts um to make sure that the documentation sort of build um for for the for the pages that you're going to serve on the web um, uh, don't break. Um, so some Docs code systems are uh, more complicated uh, than this. Um, and if you are a solo sort of shop, you know, like you're, you're the uh, lone developer on a project and it's, you know, maybe it's like a, a, a side project and whatnot, um, you might not even use things like issue tracking, right, to figure out um, how or what needs to be updated in your project documentation. Uh, but for, for the most part, um, it's, it's uh, Adopt-as code system uh, is going to contain um, these elements that you see um, on, on the screen. All right, so um, are folks familiar with Hugo or just static site generators in general. Um, if you if you don't want to chime in with your microphone, um, you can also just type through the chat. Um, I know Hugo. Okay. And Chris chimed in with static site generators. Yes, Hugo. No. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Static site generators, uh, in case uh, there's someone watching this and they're not super familiar, um, that, uh, well, static sites just mean that um, whatever is being <clears throat> sort of uh, served um, uh, to you as the client when you're, uh, when you're uh, you know, sort of navigating to a, to a page on the web, um, it's already sort of the full like generated uh, kind of HTML uh, plus assets that are <clears throat> uh, needed for the for the entire site to show up, uh, as opposed to a dynamic site where you know you might uh, sort of open up a web page um, and then that sort of web request kind of goes to a database, figures out all right what are the different um, things that I need to put together an an HTML file and then sort of builds all of that um, at that point in time. 
Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, I know that wasn't the most elegant sort of explanation of uh, static site versus, versus dynamic site. Um, but um, the point of static sites is that um, it's going to look the same and have the same content for everyone who might be uh, looking at that, at that page. And it's a great and, and, and standard choice for documentation websites um, since, you know, presumably you don't really need um, anything about the reader or the user to figure out what you should display on the documentation um, site, right? It's going to look the same for everyone. It's going to contain the same information for everyone. Um, uh, static sites, uh, I believe, would also probably be uh, faster to build and also faster to kind of load, I think, um, for, uh, for, the, for the end user. Um, so, so needless to say, it's a, it's a very common choice for, for things like documentation or even blogs. Uh, um, static site generators are popular for, for blogs sort of websites as well. Um, probably all uh, or, or the most popular uh, static site generators are going to have the option um, to um, add like pre-delivered themes uh, or pre-built themes that you could use to uh, sort of style or, or, or um, uh, figure out, you know, like a look and feel for, for your site. Um, I'm pretty sure the most popular ones have their own sort of <clears throat> official themes, uh, and I'm sure uh, they also have, uh, you know, some custom themes that uh, other people, uh, sort of external uh, folks may have, may have built as well that you can use. So that really, you know, helps take care of um, uh, not having to figure out, you know, CSS or styling or anything like that um, when it comes to your when it comes to your documentation. So that allows you to focus really on just on just the content. So in addition to Hugo, um, other popular uh, static site generators are Jekyll and Gatsby. Uh, I am told that Hugo tends to be a little bit faster compared to Jekyll. Um, uh, not super sure how to confirm that. Um, I have used Hugo a lot more. Um, uh, I think Jekyll maybe I only used once really and I don't even really recall how that went. Um, I dabbled a little bit in Gats with Gatsby uh, and I think Gatsby is a popular choice for if you want to use React um, with your static site. Um, it is. Uh, okay, great. Um, so and I think it's supposed to be like a static site generator, like plus. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's it's bonkers powerful, but it's also yeah. like huge learning curve and mm -hmm. it's it's big. And, right. and Jekyll's right. like, Jekyll's the OG static site generator. It's been right. around for a yeah. long time. Right, exactly. Um, yep, so um, it, to me, it kind of sounds like, you know, Hugo is kind of a decent sort of middle ground between like, uh, something that is, you know, widely used, um, still in active development, um, but also, I mean, there is a learning curve as, as we'll, we'll see in a little bit, but it's, it's probably, or I don't think it's as uh, steep as Gatsby. But that's just my, my experience and my opinion. Yeah, I think Gatsby is one of those things where if you want to do the, the basic thing, like, I have some markdown files and I want to render a template. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But as soon as you want to have like data coming in from other sources, it can get kind of wild. Would you say that it's um, um, a, uh, like too much if, if, that's all you, if that's all that you want to do? Um, no, because it, it all kind of stays out of your way. I mean, if you're like uh -huh. a JavaScript person or you're a React dev, Mm -hmm. um, it's really a great way to have like pre-rendered React right. components that like load instantly because they get served up static and then sort of rehydrated into like a living, you know, breathing dynamic client-side page. 
Um, so it's really cool for all that. So if like, if that fits your bill, then it's, it's great. And it's pretty easy to get started with. Mm -hmm. But if you want to like pull in stuff from this API to generate things and you have these blog pages, oh, but you also have this thing and maybe you know, somebody needs to sign up on this form, like mm -hmm. better learn GraphQL too, because it's right. all GraphQL. Yeah, right, so. exactly. Right. Oh, well, it all just um, kinda, I guess it, it yeah, they fit, they, it fits its niche really well. Yeah. But, you know, and, and I think Hugo kind of serves a different niche that's also really good for exactly what it is. So, mm -hmm. right. All right, cool. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really good to know. And it's, it's really good to hear about other people's experience with, with these things as well. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, anyone else who's watching this who um, isn't super sure what to use, um, hopefully that helps kind of give clarity uh, or, or a little bit of guidance. Um, I would like to assume that the folks on this call are familiar with Git, um, although people, there might be people who are watching this who are not familiar with Git, so I'll just, uh, I'll talk a little bit a little bit about it as well. Oh, chat. Sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat. <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, okay, so for, uh, in case you're not familiar with Git, um, it's, it's a version control system, um, which uh, basically I like to think about it as um, putting in save points uh, in your project development um, so that you're able to see kind of the history of, of how uh, your project has been built out uh, and also revert to sort of previous uh, or earlier save points um, if necessary. So um, uh, it's also, oops. okay, um, distributed uh, meaning, uh, well, it allows you to do distributed sort of uh, or collaborative work uh, with, with other people as well. Um, and still sort of maintain that kind of uh, version history uh, uh, in your project. Uh, docs can definitely um, uh, go with, uh, you know, your, your Git sort of um, uh, setup as well. Um, and, and in docs code, obviously, that's, uh, that's going to be like a key element of, 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 what, of what we'll be doing here. And uh, I'm not a Git expert at all. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I am quite familiar with a lot of the basic sort of like standard commands. Uh, and, and later on, we'll, we'll together look at a couple of more advanced sort of Git topics that I'm still um, sort of getting familiarized with. Um, uh, Folks here might be might already know about uh, Git work trees and Git sub modules. Um, if if you are familiar with that, awesome. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to kind of uh, give us a little bit more background or context on how uh, these Git concepts work. And if not, we'll kind of uh, work through that together and, and sort of see how how those concepts uh, fit in um, in our sort of hands-on portion of. of of this, of this crash course. But basically, uh, your specific Git workflow will depend on, again, um, your, your requirements, your team, your project. Um, there is not really, there are best practices for sure, um, but um, as far as I know, there's, there's not the one like Git workflow that everyone has to follow ever. Um, and this is a, uh, an example of, of basically what we're going to do uh, for the hands-on portion. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, we're going to have, uh, you know, some project sort of uh, uh, source code uh, that we'll add um, documentation content to. Um, we'll, uh, we'll build the doc site locally and when we're happy with that we push those changes out to um to a remote repository uh at which point it then gets deployed to uh github pages um, and repeat as necessary so this is just an example of 
of what it looks like, especially if you're just, you know, if you're a lone developer on, on a, uh, on your own sort of project. Uh, some resources for Docs' code. Uh, I won't talk about this too much because um, we do want to get to the hands-on portion. Um, but it's here on the slide deck um, for your reference. And my opinion on what makes good documentation um, first is that it should be well organized. Um, and what does well organized mean? Um, there's a structure to it. Um, it's scannable, meaning that when you're looking at the page, you're, <clears throat> you're not just looking at a wall of text, uh, trying to figure out, all right, what is the, where is the information that I need exactly? Um, and, and it's easy to find what you need. So let's say you need to kind of uh, go to some other page or site to download or, or, or figure out like what dependencies or how to get certain dependencies into your project. Um, it, it points you to those um, resources instead of you kind of having to figure out, all right, how and where do I get them exactly? Well organized, um, accessible, and I don't just mean, you know, um, WCAG, I think that's how you say it, WCAG compliant, um, but also in the sense of, you know, it doesn't need to be full of technical jargon. Um, I personally prefer writing documentation in a uh, personal kind of more personal tone um, uh, using the third person. So I'm, I'm saying you uh, like directly referring to the reader uh, as if I were talking to them in person. Um, uh, that's a personal opinion. Um, other, I know other people will disagree. And it doesn't, you know, sort of make your user or your reader uh, run away screaming. But what makes great documentation, I think, um, I think a lot of it comes down to effort and resources, um, honestly, and, and that might be unfortunate because um, there are so many and, and too many places who just don't have the time or resources, right, to to really put together great documentation. Um, there are some places that have been able to manage it, um, but uh, it, it just, it requires uh, just a lot of effort. Um, but what I think, um, how I think those places hit the mark uh, in terms of making great documentation is um, they, uh, really do come from uh, a place of empathy and compassion for, for the end user. Um, they're always thinking, like, if, if, I, if I were the person reading this, um, is this actually helpful to me? Is this, is this getting me what I need? Instead of, you know, just kind of writing from your own perspective of someone, you know, who may be super familiar with, with whatever you're talking about, but then forgetting that your reader might be a lot less familiar about this topic as you are. Uh, pays attention to user, user experience. Um, so that might come in the form of, you know, uh, just um, UI uh, design, like on the page itself. Uh, and not just, you know, uh, how do I say this? Because I'm, <laughs> I know I'm going to say a double negative, uh, but instead of, uh, uh, well, good documentation is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make your users or readers run away screaming. Great doc doc documentation, I think, actually helps your users become awesome. They um, make your users like really engaged and excited about your project. Um, so I think that's the sort of, you know, part of the secret sauce of what makes uh, great versus just good. And this is, this is hard to do. Um, not, not everyone is able to do it. I probably am not <laughs> really uh, uh, able to do it um, um, sort of super consistently on the first try for, for the projects that I work on. Uh, but these are, you know, the things to aspire to and keep in mind um, if, if great talk, documentation is what we want to write. Uh, and these are some of 
the resources and examples that I like to refer to uh, when it comes to just doc writing and not just docs as code. Um, write the docs, uh, always first name. Um, Stripe documentation, I would consider it, and I think a lot of people in the tech writing <clears throat> and talk, tech documentation community would consider it pretty much the gold standard um, in documentation. It really hits a lot of those like great documentation works that I mentioned earlier. Um, and they do actually have, uh, I'm pretty sure they have like a dedicated uh, documentation team with like not just engineers, but also like product managers and like, you know, just different sort of people um, with a whole lot of knowledge working specifically uh, on docs. So that's why it's so good. Um, and some guides that uh, uh, you can refer to if you would like to um, uh, learn a little bit about, well, okay, so now I have to write documentation. How, how, do, I, how do I make this at least good? Uh, there are free courses out there. Um, I am just going to kind of include the Google tech writing course right here. Um, I haven't actually done it, uh, but I think I've heard good things about it. Um, Stephanie Murillo is a, um, uh, I think she's now an engineering manager at, I want to say Microsoft or something, uh, but she has been a, a product manager and a tech writer uh, at a couple other places before, and she's uh, written a lot of things related to just good document, not just documentation, but actually good developer content. Um, so I would highly recommend her work um, uh, if, if, you're, if you're interested. All right, hopefully I didn't talk too much. Um, and well, if I did, um, Hopefully our hands-on portion isn't going to take up too, too much time, but let's do this thing. Um, just a quick check for, for folks on, on the meeting. Um, do we have all of these things or did you, did you run into any trouble at all sort of getting these installed and you know, if you don't know what to use or whatnot. If, if we are all set, um, looks okay, like awesome. we got an A-OK -okay and a yes. Okay, perfect. Um, a few outcomes uh, that I'm hoping folks will get at the end of this thing. Um, like I said earlier, um, sure you can put together a README and Readmes definitely are important sort of pieces of documentation uh, as well. Um, but if you want to go the extra mile, um, this is how you might do it. Um, uh, hopefully this will also uh, uh, make you more comfortable with Git if you're not super comfortable with Git uh, just yet. Um, and if you are, um, we're gonna sort of do a little bit of practice on these uh, two sort of Git uh, concepts uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, learn at least the basics of Hugo. Uh, which uh, is probably uh, going to generally be similar for other popular static site generators. Um, uh, so you, it's not like there's not going to be a learning curve, uh, you know, like, like uh, I think it was Jason who was uh, talking about uh, Gatsby earlier, there's always going to be a learning curve, but um, just getting the basics of one thing is going to be immensely helpful for, for other platforms and tools that you might try. Um, and we'll take advantage of GitHub pages. It's free. Um, if you have a GitHub account, um, might as well use it. Um, especially if you, you know, don't actually need like a production ready or some other um, um, server for, for this, for this particular, for your doc project. All right, uh, general workflow. Um, so, uh, how do I, I guess I can copy this and put this in the chat, right? So that people have, yeah. 
so people can just click on it. Yeah, if you copy and paste it into the chat, the folks that are with us will be able to click on it. Okay, all right, cool. So uh, what we're uh, basically gonna do is uh, we will use that. Oh, I hope I don't stop video. Okay, <laughs> use this as our sort of boilerplate um, kind of fake project. Um, it's really just, uh, I don't even know if it has separate like style sheets. It's just HTML. <laughs> and so if I, you know, if I have this, uh, if I, if I have this repository locally, if I've downloaded it, um, if we take a look, you know, this is, this is our project, let's say, and this is what we're writing documentation about. Um, I got this from HTML5 up, which has a bunch of uh, just HTML templates. Uh, so maybe this will be useful for folks. But basically, I've bundled those uh, all together and included one or two other things in the repository, um, including the steps that we'll be going through um, to sort of um, uh, follow a Docsis code system for, for writing documentation. So yeah, um, if, if, if you all want to go ahead, um, and if you haven't done so, just go ahead and um, clone this repository uh, locally. Uh, once you're done with that, uh, let me know and we'll, we'll kind of move on to the, to the next bit, which is um, we're going to get started with Hugo soon. Uh, just let me know in the chat, I guess. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, so I have this repo um, on my local machine as well. And let me open up this. Um, if you prefer having this sort of separately on your own screen, uh, definitely go ahead and do so because I'm going to be opening up my uh, VS Code as well. So that might be helpful if you, if you are able to or if you want to kind of look at both. But basically what I'm now going to do is Um, here's my project, um, and here are the files in the project. Nothing, nothing related to documentation, right, uh, so far. So let's say that we're at the point of, of, um, we're at the point of wanting to actually just add documentation and start creating a documentation website for, for this particular project so we can share it with folks. Um, all right, um, so this is my setup. It's really pretty simple. Um, and because I don't do a whole lot of like, you know, complicated coding really, um, um, this might be simpler than what you have um, on, uh, on your own machine. Uh, but basically use VS Code. I have some linters um, that help me kind of look out for, um, you know, potential issues with with what I'm writing, um, uh, especially, you know, uh, in Markdown, uh, there's, there's a bunch of Markdown linters that you can use to help you uh, keep an eye out for um, errors and things that you can sort of uh, edit and such. Um, hi, hi, Kat, can I have a question? Hi, yeah. Okay, um, I see that you have 207 problems. How, I don't have any, what is the reason you have that again? Oh, uh, these things like pros lint and, and stuff like that? No, what it say problems, 200, 207. Oh, problems. sure. So, um, so uh, 
I'm not super sure how it looks for other uh, uh, IDEs or text editors. Uh, are you using Notice Pro? I have zero. I have zero problems. Oh, okay. Well, so uh, that's because I have all of these like linters and extensions kind of enabled for uh, for my text editor. And what that's doing is um, actually looking. Uh, it's looking at the files. Uh, these linters are looking at the files that I have open and basically um, sort of showing me, oh, uh, hey, I'm Markdown Lint. And maybe you should take a look at um, uh, this particular uh, you know, line in your crash course uh, .md file in, in, your, uh, in your workspace um, and change that uh, or update that if it needs to, if it needs to be fixed. Got it. So it's, um, it's because you're using the Markdown plugin. Yeah, 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 okay. exactly. Um, can I have a suggestion? Yeah. If you right click the crash course that MD, the file on the left, where you see in the Explorer, you right click and you mm -hmm. open preview, then it will look the, the right way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do, uh, also like to have the preview uh, open and in fact uh, you can in VS Code it allows you to do like a split uh, kind of screen so you can sort of as you're writing markdown you get to see what it actually or what it should end up looking like um, as well oh uh, control shift e isn't working it's a bummer um, so yeah, so that's, this is another thing that I, I like to do too, but yeah, the preview sort of, uh, feature in VS code is, is pretty nifty. It's, it's pretty good for, 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 mark, for markdown. Thank you. All right. Where were we? Okay. So I've got the repo. Uh, locally, mm, let's see. Maybe she should... Okay, I think that's way better. Um, I also noticed. Do you all have the main uh, sort of branch um, for your repository at this point? Um, because it used to default to, okay, yeah. I, I don't know when they changed it or what I changed or whatever, um, but uh, you might be familiar with this sort of discussion or topic sort of happening in the larger kind of tech uh, space um, uh, in terms of naming things master. Um, and I think GitHub has uh, sort of enabled this, um, uh, thing where instead of getting the master branch by default, uh, it's named main instead. So, uh, so we have main. Uh, hopefully my instructions on here do actually reflect uh, the main sort of branch as well and not master. Um, if there are mistakes, um, hopefully we'll spot them. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to add um, uh, my uh, remote repository uh, uh, using git remote uh, on the command line. Um, so are folks okay with doing that for, for, their, for their forks as well? Oh, I already have an origin. Okay, cool. Oh, well, yeah, I do, because I was just pushing things earlier. Funny how I forget things so quickly. Um, all right, so um, do folks already have the remote set up um, for, for their repos? Okay, great. Okay, so now, uh, if we, uh, since everyone has Hugo installed, 
uh, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, basically start up a new Hugo site. So it's pretty easy. I'm just gonna copy this uh, command and paste it in the terminal. I'm going to call the uh, docs um, Hugo site as docs. Um, you can call it whatever you want, basically. Um, and also, depending on the specific kind of GitHub pages um, deployment that you want to do, you may actually need to call your docs, like Hugo site, as docs. Uh, we're not using that system, but you might encounter this in the Hugo, uh, uh, or sorry, the GitHub pages documentation. Uh, so just, just a heads up, but I just want to call it docs, so we'll keep it at that. And what that will do is, uh, I now have a docs uh, subdirectory in my project, and it just contains the skeleton of a Hugo site, basically. There's not going to be any content in it because uh, we haven't added anything. Um, there isn't going to be a theme just yet. We're going to need to add that later. Um, but basically, um, when you create a new uh, Hugo site, um, it'll give you the skeleton of what you need for uh, for for that site uh, using this Hugo new site uh, command. All right, so I'm going to navigate to that subdirectory. Uh, and uh, you might have a different preference for, you know, how often you want to do commits and stuff like that. Uh, I'm just going to do one at this point because um, I, I want to add this to my version history, but if you want to leave it for later and bundle it with other things, other updates that you did, it's also fine. Um, say, um, Hugo site. Um, oh, there. Okay. Are folks okay with what they saw just now? And are you able to see my terminal actually? If that was too fast or if you have questions, let me know. All right, so I've uh, added that to my project history. And now I'm gonna add, uh, actually add some content to, to my new docs Hugo site. So let me copy and paste this in. So I have to run this in the docs directory because um, this is where you know, Hugo uh, uh, lives basically. Um, I think that if I try to run like Hugo commands in the top level of the project, it's probably not going to work or it's not going to work as expected. So just make sure that you are, uh, that you've navigated to, to your um, Hugo site within, within your overall um, project. What I'm doing here is uh, I'm adding a new, uh, what Hugo calls sections. I'm adding a new section um, called get started uh, within my uh, doc content uh, and just actually creating a, a file called index.md um, and how this basically will end up looking like is uh, um, if I uh, later when we navigate to um, the deployed site um, it's going to have a get slash started, um, uh, what do you call that thing in URLs, if, if anyone can remember the exact term um, after the dot com slash, uh, please let me know. A path? Uh, yeah, a path, yeah. Um, uh, that'll, yep, so this will basically be uh, sort of the homepage for, for that particular section, uh, which mm -hmm. will be uh, accessible via that path. All right, so it'll tell you, okay, create a new section. 
And that index.md file shows up here. I'm just going to go ahead and open that up. Um, actually, I want to stop this. this. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know you could have more than. Well, I guess that makes sense. All right. Um, let's close these. All right, uh, and when you run the um, Hugo new command, um, it basically gives you a file with uh, what they call front matter, uh, which is basically just metadata about, um, about that page. Um, so on here, you can sort of specify a title for, for that page or that section. Um, date, I guess, works for blogs and whatnot. Um, uh, if you don't need it, you can get rid of it. It's fine. Um, and you can set a page to be in draft status or, or not. So it's basically just a uh, true or false value here. Um, I'll leave it to draft for now. Um, so we can see how we can actually sort of uh, work with that, even if it's still in draft status. Oh, query string. Right. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, uh, right, so this is, uh, I'm going to create a get started uh, page on the documentation. Uh, and that's, I guess that's because my project, you know, um, there's a get started section and I want to sort of um, create a section in my documentation that like um, will have more information about this. So I'm going to add uh, just one line. You can add whatever you like uh, if you're following along. Uh, how are folks with Markdown, by the way? Um, do you all use it a lot? I know at SDG, we use it for our handbook and a lot of our student things that we put out there for them. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Markdown is pretty popular uh, as well in Docs' code. Um, it's, right, right. Um, it's, you know, it's easy. It's so easy to pick up. Um, um, I guess the sort of one of the main pain points of, of using Markdown is that it's really meant to be a lightweight kind of markup language. Uh, and so it, uh, there's a lot of things that it doesn't address well or doesn't handle well, uh, especially if, you know, if you need anything more than, um, you know, just like lines of text and some headers and stuff. Um, uh, on on your page. So um, for more like involved uh, technical content, um, I know that uh, some other teams, some other some other folks will prefer things like um, restructured text uh, or ASCII doc. Um, uh, is anyone familiar with with those uh, with those that I just mentioned? No, no, no. Okay, sure, that's fine. Um, so uh, uh, I'm not an expert in any of those. I'm just like vaguely sort of familiar with them. Um, but basically, um, I mean, it's still Docs' code. Uh, you're basically writing uh, your content in um, plain text files. Um, but I think the... Uh, ASCII doc and restructured text can be a little bit more powerful compared to Markdown in the sense that it allows you to do things like, um, uh, uh, what's, what's the term I'm, I'm looking for? Um, content reuse, uh, which is, um, let's say you want to have, uh, you know, like a, a, a bunch of content that you want to kind of publish in many different sort of places and layouts. Um, Markdown doesn't do that super well on its own. Uh, I think you can probably 
come up with a hacky way to to do that but um um and and it's it's doable uh but i think uh uh markup language is like uh restructured text or ascii doc or are uh, a little bit better equipped to do that sort of out of the box um, so so those other languages or those other systems uh, i think they are preferred by like more sort of uh, serious technical writers like um, um, uh, if, if companies have like that using that instead of markdown um, i find that markdown is fine uh, for a lot of cases and a lot of uses, um, but but it does have its limitation. It, it has its limitations, um, so it's it's good to know what the other options are. And a uh, slightly higher, uh, I believe, uh, learning curve for those other two compared to Markdown as well. Okay, this is the content that I want to add to my documentation. Great. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Can I use ASCII doc or text? What was it called? Restructured text. Restructured text uh, with Hugo. Uh, with what? Sorry. With Hugo. Oh, um, yeah, I think so. Um, off the top of my head, I don't actually know for sure, but I know that Hugo works with other uh, uh, these other languages as well. So I I'm pretty sure you can. Okay. Thanks. All right, so, uh, okay, I've added content to my documentation, hooray. Um, so with Hugo, you can actually sort of preview, do a preview of your site um, locally uh, by running the Hugo server command. Um, and if we add the D, capital D switch, um, that should, uh, that means uh, include pages and draft status as well. So let's see what happens when we run this. So it'll tell you where you can go to view uh, the site locally. And if I open it up in a browser, nothing yet. Um, that's because we haven't added a theme, so. Let's go ahead and do that. And it'll sort of let you know uh, when you run Hugo server as well, uh, there might be like things. Uh, actually, let me try, let me try that again, because maybe something will show up with um, the query string that we talked about earlier, right? get started. Oh, that's because I stopped the dev server. This is the part of the crash course that is very like, I'm not sure if this is going to work. We'll find out. Um, so if you're following along, uh, let me know if um, that's not working out for you or if you're seeing something different. Um, and if you wanna move faster uh, as well, um, feel free to go ahead and do that. But um, basically, um, this is a very sort of uh, gonna be a free flowing kind of portion of, of tonight's course. All right, that didn't work for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a theme. We'll add the doc doc theme. Um, and if you have, uh, no, I'll just copy and paste this in the chat. So that this is the documentation for the for this Hugo theme, but the actual repository is found. Let me get this. To you all as well can be found here. So I'm going to paste in this 
git submodule command um, in the terminal. And again, not an expert by any means um, in Git or in Git submodules. Uh, but basically what a submodule is, is it's kind of like having a Git repository within a Git repository. And what that, and the way that you can think about it, I think is that that submodule is kind of like a dependency in your project. So, you know, uh, someone else uh, could be doing active development on, on this particular project and whatnot. Um, if you've added it as a submodule in your project, you'll be able to um, either pull in um, those sort of updates uh, on that repo, uh, right? Or you can choose to leave it uh, as is. So uh, I think the way or the reason that it's, um, it's, it's a recommended sort of practice um, in, with Hugo themes. There are other ways to uh, add a theme to your Hugo project, uh, but I've seen uh, quite a number of, of themes sort of saying, just add this as a Git submodule, it's the best way. Anyone use Git submodules before? Yep, extensively. Okay, awesome. What do you, uh, what's, uh, uh, what do you, what's the most frequently used that you, you've seen so far? Usually, um, like if we want to break a kind of big project up into smaller separate repositories. Mm -hmm. So an example might be um, on our website, uh, on the Suncoast Devs website, we have a code of conduct that predates that website by a lot like the repository is just the code of conduct it goes back to like 2015 mm -hmm. and rather than put like a copy of it in the repo for our website i embed the code of conduct itself which is really just a repository with a readme and a markdown file that has the actual code of conduct in it um, and we embed that as a git sub module and then i use gatsby to pull that in and render it as a page like any other um, but it gets to kind of keep its own separate lineage and history and everything um, on on the website. And there's a, you know, you could use it for like dependencies too. So if you've got um, maybe some like internal projects that aren't like, you know, like published packages of code that you want to push out there, mm -hmm. um, and you can pull them together that way. There's a lot of different uses for it. I like to, I describe it to students as like a, it's a Git repository in your Git, inside your Git repository. And I think of like the exhibit meme, you know, it's like, yo, yo dogs, I heard you like Git. So I put some yeah. Git inside your Git so you can get what you get. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a, yeah, <laughs> that's a really, a really great way of uh, sort of, that's a great analogy, I think. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, definitely the um, idea of, of that having its own um, lineage, its own sort of version history, um, you're absolutely right. Um, so yeah, so uh, Hugo tends to uh, recommend uh, using the Git submodule um, method of, of managing or adding themes to, to your Hugo projects. All right, cool. Um, and I think I have to do these things as well, like actually initialize. Um, the submodule within, within the repo. All right, so now we've added the theme as a submodule, um, but we do actually have to modify this config file um within within the docs um directory just to make sure that um it knows what the we're using i'm just going to copy and paste that uh i believe it uh the value has to or the string has to match the um the uh, name name of the theme sort of uh, directory. So let's go ahead and do that. And if we try running Hugo server again, 
maybe something will show up. Hey, hey I got something. And this is my uh, get started um, page. Uh, Hugo has this, um, uh, I don't know what to call it really, um, but index.md versus underscore index.md. Um, basically these index uh, files have specific kind of um, functions or uses um, for, for Hugo projects. Um, basically, the way that I like to think about it is if within my Hugo site, I want um, a section to have its own child sections with its own, like, however many pages that I want to include, um, in the, uh, with, within the top level of that particular section, I have to have an underscore index.md file as opposed to index, just index.md. So that's the way that I like to remember it. I've, I've read the documentation. It's a little, it's a little bit hard to wrap my head around. Um, I don't know if anyone else is familiar with it, um, but basically there's, there's um, index.md versus underscore index.md that absolutely matters in Hugo. And that has to do with the way that they organize, they want you to organize your, your content within, within the project. But for me, I just want to get started uh, page. I don't need it to have multiple sections. I just want it to have the one page. So this is going to work totally fine. All right, so now um, I think I'm pretty, pretty happy with this. I want to push this to I just want to put I just want to push it to my fork. So I'll just go ahead and do that. Sorry, I was away for two minutes. Um what was the reason that it wasn't working before? Oh, when I um, when I went to localhost da 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 and um, didn't actually see anything on the browser. Yes. Yeah, that's because I hadn't added the theme yet. Um, uh, in order for Hugo to basically build the pages as as they are going to be served to um, the browser. Uh, it needs to know what theme you're using so that it's able to actually sort of build, you know, uh, the, the HTML page or pages, um, the, the different style sheets that you'll be using and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so if you don't have a theme, you need to add it in order for, um, for the pages to actually render. And the, and, way you just, added, and the way you added the themes was? And the way I added that was I used, um, so I added it as a git submodule first. I ran this git command, run these other commands after doing git submodule add. Uh, and then after that, I made sure that I added the theme um, to my config.toml file, which you can find uh, inside of the docs basically your Hugo um, directory within your project. So find it Thanks. and it's just here. All right. Um, okay, we have about 30 or something minutes. That might actually work out fine. All right, so now let's say, okay, I've written I've written enough stuff and I want to actually publish my documentation um, to GitHub pages. So um, Hugo, as well as GitHub, they do actually have documentation on how to do that. Um, GitHub 
pages, I think by default, um, or just out of the box, you can use Jekyll um, with it, um, which you know is, is fine as well. Um, and for this crash course, um, I could have used Jekyll, but I'm just a lot more familiar with Hugo, so that's what I went with. Um, but, but you can use other static site generators uh, for sure with, with GitHub pages. Um, and Hugo has docs uh, specifically for deploying um, <clears throat> your, your Hugo site to um, different sort of platforms. Uh, so Netlify, Firebase, all that stuff um, in, addition to, in addition to just GitHub pages. But okay, um, I want to deploy my doc site because it's looking really awesome and I want people to read it. So the first thing that I want to do is make sure that I've updated my, here, my base URL um, uh, value in, in the TOML file. So what I'm actually going to do here is, uh, this is wrong, but we'll, we'll just use it as a uh, kind of uh, learning point uh, for the course. Because I, I frequently find that if I make a mistake over something and then I fix it, it's easier for me to remember like, why I had to do it this way. Um, here is my. So we have to set our base URL file in config.toml. And I guess we'll just change the title to Stellar Documentation. And um, let me double check that I've changed it to, yep. So now I'm going to do an actual Hugo build. So instead of just running a dev server um, to kind of double check how, how my Hugo site is looking so far, I'm actually going to run the Hugo command, which will generate the site, build out the static pages, um, and add it, to, um, add it to our project. So if the Hugo build uh, runs successfully, um, by default, it will create a new, um, if you're doing this for the first time, it will create a new uh, public directory within the Hugo um, uh, project. And, and the, so what we're actually gonna do, I'd mentioned this before, What we're going to do in terms of deploying to GitHub pages is, well, there's a couple of options. You can keep, um, uh, you can keep things to the master branch, or you can have a dedicated uh, GH pages branch to keep track of um, your uh, site build and deploy history separate from the rest of your um, project code. Uh, I, I've used both um, and I think it really probably comes down to your preference in terms of how you want your git uh, sort of commit history or you know your version history to look like. Um, uh, but uh, this is this is a little bit more complicated, uh, but I think it's also cool because um, well, I got to learn I got to learn um, uh, work trees as well. So, um, but I've used both. Um, the this option is definitely the simplest and easiest. You just need to kind of uh, change this little setting on your config file. Um, and here's the, 
I had mentioned this earlier um, uh, in terms of uh, your, your generated uh, static pages being uh, kept within a docs folder as opposed to um, uh, something else. I think I mentioned that earlier, but let's move on. Um, all right, so the point of having a separate uh, branch is, again, if you want to kind of keep the version history sort of separate, um, you don't actually want your Hugo builds to kind of show up on your project uh, version history, right? You want to keep that in your new sort of GH pages branch. Um, so what we'll do at this point, um, according to the documentation, um, is to, we'll, we'll add the generated pages, uh, the generated static files to uh, get ignore, uh, and then we'll um, create the new GH pages branch and then sort of do do our deploys uh, on that new branch using using Git work trees. So I'm gonna go back to my text editor and uh, I don't have a git anymore. Yeah, I don't think, but. Right, there it is. So this will kind of exclude the public folder uh, from, um, from uh, getting pushed back up to, uh, to your fork or to your remote um, repository. And we'll create our new GH pages branch. And the orphan uh, option basically means that um, right. So uh, usually, when you uh, sort of create a new branch, um, it sort of inherits um, that version history, the commit history from um, uh, where you're creating the new branch off of. But in this case, our project commit history doesn't really make sense to keep in our GitHub, in our GH pages history, right? We wanna keep things completely separate. So we're gonna have an orphan uh, Git branch uh, that has its completely, you know, it's its own um, version history that really doesn't have anything to do with what you might be doing in terms of developing your, your, your project. It's an orphan branch. Uh, and I think this, um, I forget why I need to do git reset hard, but it is in the documentation, so I do it. <laughs> and, and I'll add my first commit uh, on this, branch. And if I push it to my remote, Pulling this up now. All right. So now uh, the remote repository has the um, GH pages branch as well. And what this also does is in your repository settings, you can scroll down. 
it's actually uh, able to sort of automatically detect that you have a GH pages branch and it'll set your uh, GitHub pages source to that branch. So um, I didn't I didn't touch anything in uh, the settings previously. I kind of just saw, oh, you have a GH pages branch. So presumably this is where you want to build um, your project pages off of. Um, this isn't going to work because there's nothing in it. We haven't actually um, uh, uh, sort of built uh, or, or added or generated Hugo uh, static pages to it yet. So let's go back to our terminal. Oh, I'm pulling up my stop CN. And I'm going to back to my main branch and add a work tree. But first, I think I need to remove my generated uh, Hugo sort of files. From here, uh, so the the way that I understand um, Git word trees is um, it allows you to have uh, multiple. Uh, branches that you can actively uh, develop with and, and work on at once. So I think normally what you would do is um, say, you know, you're developing in some feature branch um, and then you need to kind of go to yet a different branch and do some other work there. Um, before you switch to that other branch, you have to either stash your work, right, or you, or you do a commit or, or something, like you save your work before being able to switch over um, uh, to a different context. Um, but with Git work trees, um, you don't have to do that. It's, it's kind of like you're able to uh, jump back and forth uh, between uh, different uh, feature or working branches um, without having to go through the trouble of, um, you know, stashing and committing and all that stuff. Um, uh, Jason or Catherine, are you familiar with Git work trees at all? That was a pretty good explanation. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, hopefully that will make sense to uh, folks listening. Uh, but what this will now let us do is And on main. Do I need to okay, let's let me build. So while we're on like the root of the Hugo project, um, we can see that we're currently on the main um, branch. But if we but if we navigate to uh, the public directory, it just automatically knows that we're on a different branch. Um, and if we so now um, according to git we have 
um, all of these changes um, or all of these files that could be that could be added to to the um, version history within within a within this particular branch. I'm uh, not super sure that I missed something. Maybe I did, but we'll see how this goes. So I've uh, run another Hugo uh, build, or maybe I didn't actually. Uh... Oh yeah, right, 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 right. So I ran a Hugo build, uh, added that to my GH pages, um, or I'm gonna add that to my GH pages branch history, and now, if I push this um, up to my remote, So it has a completely sort of separate um, commit history compared to compared to main. And if we go to our project page, maybe something will show up. Right, that doesn't look right. So we probably did something wrong. Um, gonna go back to text editor and I'm just gonna switch back up to main. Let's see, I have two. Oh well. Okay, hmm. Did I do this earlier when I tested it? But it's fine. And this is probably, I mean, it, it can get tricky um, with, with this sort of method of deploying uh, to GitHub pages. Uh, Git work trees, took me a really, really, really long time to uh, sort of get used to and wrap my head around. Um, so you may encounter what I'm encountering now, which is, well, what the hell happened? I thought, I, I thought I'd um, changed or updated my config file. Um, so not to worry, that's like totally normal. Um, and let's see where things are. And, and I know you can do things like, you know, run git diff and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, I need to get better at that stuff too. So git can really help you out um, in these sorts of situations where, you know, something went wrong and you're just not quite sure. You have like a feeling that maybe you did something in this particular place, but you're not sure. Um, uh, if you learn git well enough, it will save your butt. Um, and this is not just a developer thing, but you know, if if um, if you're going to be someone who's, who uses the Docsis code system, maybe as a um, developer relations person or or a technical writer um, working with a team of engineers, uh, really learning Git is is so worth it. Um, it is confusing, and I have not met anyone who has said that Git is easy or intuitive necessarily, but uh, it's a powerful tool. Um, 
and it's a really good tool to sort of have under your belt. So that's my little spiel about Git while I try to remember what I need to do in this situation. Um, but if anyone already knows what, what happened, feel free to let me know. But I do know that I need to change this. Oh, so much for that learning point that I wanted to show earlier. Um, I don't think there's any time, so I'm just going to go ahead and put in the correct. Um, uh, correct. I think I'm gonna. Oh, well, I'm just gonna add another page to my docs site, just so we have more things to. So I think when I ran the Hugo build earlier, um, because config.toml didn't have the theme value, I wasn't really able to sort of do anything in terms of generating the pages. So uh, what I'll do is, do I still have? Just get rid of that and try to do this whole thing again uh, since we have a little bit of time left. Get work tree prune is going to get rid of. I thought it would get rid of um, um, the work trees that you've added. Um, maybe I need to do. Do I need to delete? Need to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. It's just the name of them. I'll try that. Um, let's look.
Okay, great. Uh, hopefully we're at a spot where we want to be. Um, and I'm going to do that entire thing again and see how things work out. So uh, I don't have my public uh, directory, so I'm going to I think I could probably just do this. Uh, hold on. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up. Okay, here we are. Okay, I probably did something wrong in the uh, where I generated my uh, Hugo site uh, and was also trying to add the work tree because um, it's looking like Yeah, basically, I want this to have my generated pages, like HTML, uh, all the style sheets, and all that stuff. And we clearly don't have that here. Um, so I'm just going to try again. And hopefully, I'll have enough time to figure that out before we have to run. So I'm adding a work tree again. So my public folder has showed up again and it is now reflecting what I have um, on my GH pages branch uh, in my remote repository. So now I think if I run the Hugo build again, Okay, so within my public directory, I've got HTML, CSS, and all of these different resources and assets. So that looks kind of promising. Um, so now if I kind of jump over to my GH pages branch, um, and It now sees all of these uh, new generated files um, that could be added to um, our version history. So let's do that. You may prefer to uh, use a more meaningful commit message, um, but this is just what I'm going to go with for now. And I'm going to push that to back up to my remote and see if that actually works. Okay. So if I look at um, 
my repo on github.com. Uh, I think this means that the site is building. Uh, anyone more familiar with GitHub uh, might be able to confirm or correct that. The, uh, the, um, is it yeah. Yellow? Yeah, it usually means there's um, some sort of build task going on. Right. Right. I'm more familiar with it in issues and pull requests when there's like uh -huh. continuous integration stuff set up, but mm -hmm. I think you're, I think you're correct there. Okay. Oh, now we got a check mark. Looks promising. Um, so now if we open up Hmm, I don't think that's what I wanted to see. But progress. Um, now, when we go to our GitHub uh, project pages URL, it actually shows us, you know, Stellar documentation, which was the title that we gave then that, you know, that we Ooh. set for our project pages um, in the config HAML file. Um, this. I thought we had added uh, something to our homepage, which was the this index file right here. Um, but that didn't work, but no big deal. Um, and if we go to this section, <laughs> that didn't work. But we have a website, has yeah. got some errors. <laughs> it's live. Uh, it was able to build. Um, so I think we're just going to take that as a win, uh, especially yes. since we're reaching the end of this crash course. <laughs> um, but I guess I'll just say like one more thing. Um, and then, and then awesome. we can wrap this up. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So, um, so just as you know, um, uh, writing writing your project code or developing uh, your your projects, you're you're gonna run into this sort of stuff, right? Where um, uh, you thought you did something or changed something and it didn't quite work, so you're gonna have to go back um, and basically troubleshoot, figure out uh, what went wrong uh, using tools at your disposal, such as you know Git. Uh, and all of that stuff, uh, and then try again. Um, in a Docs code system, um, you know, if you're if you're already a developer, um, this sort of mindset or this process should be kind of um, familiar to you, right? Um, and you know, if if you're not currently a developer, um, and you know, this this entire thing might look so complicated and so just way, you know, it might be flying way over your head. And that and that's totally fine. Um, we all start somewhere and and this is by no means. I mean, this is a relatively simple Docs code uh, workflow that I've demonstrated here. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call it as just super easy and something that you can sort of pick up right, you know, on the first try, just like coding. Um, but hopefully um, this, this has shown you uh, some helpful things. Uh, namely, you know, if you have a GitHub account and you are sort of uh, storing or kind of uh, sharing your project code uh, on GitHub, you can take advantage of GitHub pages. It's totally free. Um, and it is a great way to sort of host things like documentation. Uh, you can use it to host your portfolio and stuff like that as well. Um, so, so this is just an example of how you might be able to take advantage of GitHub pages. Um, and uh, we also saw basically how to build a Hugo site um, uh, using the command line. I don't know if Hugo has like a GUI kind of interface, um, not sure, but um, it does require, you know, um, using the command line and running commands off of that. Um, Hugo does have documentation, so, uh, and the quick start is also like a great way to just kind of get a feel for basically what you need to do in order to get things 
uh, up and running. So uh, hopefully this was um, uh, helpful in terms of uh, seeing how, you know, relatively uh, straightforward it could be to just get an entire website up and running. Um, it doesn't have to take super long. You don't have to code a whole lot of CSS, HTML in order to do this kind of thing. Um, we saw a couple of, you know, more advanced, uh, hopefully helpful and cool uh, Git concepts uh, with, with sub-modules and uh, work trees. And um, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, I guess it's mostly it. Um, it's a bummer that I wasn't able to actually get this to work, but oh well, um, that happens. <laughs> um, but I do have, and I can include this in, the, in my slides as well, I have an example of, of something that I actually um, um, published using this exact system and this exact workflow that I tried to demonstrate today. So I can include that in the slides and people can take a look uh, and I'll share the uh, repository as well and, 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 um, and, and this reference um, with the steps that I took for the workflow um, in case people wanna, wanna take a look at that and try it on their own time. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, right, and I'll just, uh, I guess I'll email you um, these uh, resources and materials and um, get them shared. This is great, thank you. We, um, we use uh, almost, we use Gatsby instead of Hugo, but other than this, the workflow is the same for our mm -hmm. uh, student handbook. Um, uh -huh. It's basically a repository full of markdown files and then squirreled uh -huh. away in one folder is the actual website project code. But for people contributing, it's just folders and folders full of markdown. Mm -hmm. And um, the last week I spent a couple hours training my mom who has like a, um, a court reporting legal secretary kind of background and she's gone back to school to get a degree in technical writing. And oh, cool. um, I'm like... I'm like, hey, I got some stuff that none of us are writers. <laughs> Can you help out? <laughs> and um, so she's, she's going to start going through and um, helping us with writing style and grammar and, and you know, mm -hmm. clarity and, and, and yeah. you know, highlight areas that we could, you know, improve if it, you know, if it's somebody with a technical background needs to, to do the writing. But as far as the workflow and contributing, you know, she's, you know, uh, 60 something year old woman with no tech background who's uh you know killing it you know learn it she did her first pull request last week so yeah, yeah that's so awesome and and i yeah. do think that like uh in case there are folks out there who might you know be watching this at a later time and go like oh like i don't i don't actually know if i want to be like an engineer or whatever but i do like writing and i am interested in tech this is absolutely like one way that you can get into this space, right? Like you don't, you don't have to be a developer necessarily or an engineer or whatever uh, in order to have a career in tech. Um, and this sort of stuff, like this workflow, like you said, it's, it's really pretty standard. It's pretty common. Um, and if you're able to kind of uh, build, you know, like a sample um, static site, uh, and be able to show that off. Um, and also, uh, of course, like demonstrate like, um, you know, um, uh, writing, writing skills. Um, this is like, this, this can get you through the door, even if, you know, you don't necessarily uh, know like JavaScript or React or, or whatever. Um, this is a great app to, to kind of get in. Absolutely. Alrighty, um, that's it for me. Uh, thanks so much. And um, yeah, I, uh, oh, and I'll include my email address as well in case, you know, people kind of wanna, wanna get in touch or reach out um, through there. Um, Great, thank you so much. All right, thank you, have Kat. a good night, bye. Bye, thank you.